There will be spoilers ahead. Lots of spoilers, so be careful, won't you? This is it, the last episode in our series, What's So Funny? An examination of comedies from then and now. And this week, we get to the most now we have had in a long, long time. Barbie was the surprise hit of 2023, often seen in double features along with Oppenheimer? Yeah, yeah, he's cool. <laughs> That's not Oppenheimer. <laughs> sure, it could have been. It, it was a thing. I just don't know why. One movie is about existential crises, a world at war, an examination of the human condition, and the other was Oppenheimer. <laughs> oh, no burden, man. Just, just a little <laughs> joke there. Speaking of jokes, I know none better than our host, Max. I'm not Ken Levine. Say something toy-like, Max. I can wear all of Ken's clothes. No, no, you can't. On my hand. Well, that's, yeah. And me, I'm the Alan to his Barbie, Mike, (laughs) I can't bend my knees loose. This movie was suggested by one of our listeners, Dr. Professor Rebecca Pelkey, and honestly, it's really just kind of perfect to end this series. Is that because it's a great comedy or because it's very, very, very much not? Well, there's only one way to find out, and that's to listen to the show. And we start things off with... Poll Question! This time last time, we asked y'all, what's your favorite musical moment in a film, be it musical or no? You sang us the praises of the following. Steve Harvey was up first with, quote, the strains of O Mio Bambino Caro playing at the opening credits of Merchant Ivory's Room with a View. Oh, wow. Actually, all of the musical moments in that film, end quote. Sounds like a good one. Have you seen that one? I have. Oh, was it good? It is actually very good. It's very British. Room with a View. No, I've seen Howard's End. Yeah. (laughs) What you, then. what you do in your private life is written on the bathroom walls. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Steve. <laughs> George Saulnier answered next with, quote, During the heartbreakingly beautiful and devastatingly sad final scene of Longtime Companion, when the song Postmortem Bar kicks in, it is perfectly supporting the scene, end quote. Mm. I don't know it personally, but I always like to hear about new stuff. That's thanks, a very George. sad movie. Well, we have a song like Postmortem Bar. Yeah. Yeah. Matthew Reisman wrote, quote, The first time Jack Black gets the kids into the idea of being in a rock band in School of Rock. End oh, quote. oh yeah. that is a cool scene. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Matt. With a big, detailed answer, Adam Mark posted, quote, Jurassic Park, 1993. Huh. When the delegation of paleontologists and lawyers first arrive in the island, John Williams Corey hints at mysteriousness as the jeeps dip and weave through the jungle and then grass. The music goes from pianissimo to mezzo pianissimo to mezzo forte as each of the travelers, one by one, is eaten by... No, no. Sees something that the viewer cannot. They look up in sheer speechless astonishment, and then William Strings gracefully come in as the Brachiosaurus first waddles by... Waddles? Everyone arcing their heads up as though it were the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Where's the dinosaurs? There should be dinosaurs. The dinosaur's animalistic grunts echo the strings. Mm. His words, not mine. Then we pan out upon the surrounding fields to see herds upon herds of dinosaurs as majestic as dances with wolves bison on the limitless American plains. Williams adds a vocal chorus to join the strings. You did it, you bastard, you did it, Jeff Goldblum whispers, whispers, swearing as much at Spielberg as he does the island's host John Hammond, (laughs) playfully played by Richard Attenborough. The climax of the musical movement is joined by the Brachiosaurus' final stomp. It was the most prominent early CGI in cinema, the first many audience members had ever seen, and it is amazing animation, acting, and music, perfectly woven for a scene for the ages. It could not work without any of them. If the Oscars had an award for best scene, as I as I have futilely often advocated for, mm. this one would win hands down. Alas, the lawyer then intones, quote, we're going to make a fortune off this place, end quote, foreshadowing CGI's future of domination in action cinema at the expense of plot, writing, and basically everything else, culminating in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh-oh. Ouch. But oh well, perhaps this scene has made it worth it, end quote. <coughs> wow, that is a lot of answer. That is incredibly detailed. I did not put that much thought into that particular scene. That's really interesting. Me either, but thanks, uh, Adam. Yeah. Mostly I just kept thinking, uh, it's an hour and ten minutes, where's the dinosaurs? <laughs> <laughs> 
Tyler Stewart was a bit more brief. Quote, there's a certain scene in The Marvels that comes to mind, avoiding spoilers. End quote. Oh. Thanks for not giving it away, Tyler. I have no idea what it is. I bet I know. I've seen something in the preview. Is it when the music goes, da 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 Hope you like our show. No? Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what it is. You, you nailed it. Sorry, Tyler. He spoiled it for everyone. Spoils. That's my middle name. Mm-hmm. Val Coombs took time away from her keyboard writing another stellar script for the Q Footsteps podcast, second best podcast in the universe, to send us, quote, thought of another one when the circus cast and the greatest showman sings, This Is Me. Thanks, Val. Oh, I've still know. never seen that one. Yeah, me either. Suggester of this week's movie, Dr. Rebecca Pelkey, offered, quote, lots of great feeling moments, that oboe solo in Star Wars when Luke is still on Tatooine comes to mind, mm. but my first thoughts went to the really fun and fast ones, like the opening scene of Baby Driver, though I know oh. the film has other issues later on. Yes, well, one big one anyway, named Kevin Spacey. Oops! Yeah. They're playing with diegetic, non-diegetic sounds in fun ways, and the fight in the Rainbow Bridge in Thor Ragnarok with Led Zeppelin's Immigrant Song, which is fun and also has super appropriate ly- lyrics considering how the movie tackles colonialism, end quote. Damn, that's wow. some deep thoughts. Yeah. Plus, um, Max, you can help me with this. Sure. Diegetic? Isn't that that book by L. Ron Hubbard? Yeah, that's it, exactly. <laughs> no, no diege- I, re- I remember this one from a film class. Uh, diegetic sound... Is sign sound signed? Yeah. <laughs> sign sound delivered. <laughs> is sound that the characters in the movie can hear. Oh. Like if you if you break into song in the movie and the other characters hear it. Non diegetic is like background music stuff they can't hear. Oh, cool, yeah. neat. Didn't even know. I bet you didn't know that had a name. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except for L. Ron Hubbard. Well, thanks, Becca. Dan Schaefer snuck in with a response to Dr. Pelkey with, quote, basically the entire soundtrack of Baby Driver is amazing, end quote. Oh, no, not end quote. Uh, Edgar Wright specifically planned all the music and the filming and editing together, and it works so well, end quote. It did. Thanks, Dan. Agatha Gasparoni posted, quote, the climax of Inception when all the worlds are collapsing in slow motion and the theme Hans Zimmer wrote comes in the most dramatic, loudest thing in the world. Brom! End quote. <laughs> That's what she actually wrote. Brom. That's Which, actually a pretty good, uh, I don't know what you would call it, alliteration of... Uh, onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia of the yeah. sound. Oh, thanks, Agatha. Jamie Kleinert, who knows with thing or two about music, gave us, quote, binary sunset, plus the planet's quotes in the opening shot of A New Hope, mm. the red violin, all of it. Mm. Well, those are together, but cheesy, but the premiere scene in Mr. Holland's opus, just because at that critical point in the music, the music is a character. Williams and Hans Zimmer are master craftsmen in score design. Zimmer does a lot more with electronics and atmospheric composing, while Williams is a master at creating light motif, I'm sorry, late motif, mm. and plot foreshadowing. I can't remember who the third guy is I normally include in this list when I was teaching my soundtracks in commercial, not pop, music lesson in the music appreciation class I taught at the community college level. He died in a plane crash several years back, and this is going to bug me, end quote. Mm. Then she remembered and came back with, quote, James Horner. He did Avatar, Titanic, Braveheart, and many others. Wow. Horner was even better than Williams at lifting chunks from extant classical works and resetting it to the advantage of the piece he was writing, end quote. Well, thanks, Jamie. We mm. won't point out too much of that um, lifting. <clears throat> John Williams and, uh, uh, yeah, it's not there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> We're not, well, I mean, it's not exactly like it's Puccini's greatest hits, yeah. but he was a big fa- fan of Stravinsky, so, huh. yeah. Nick Hoffman's thoughts were, quote, as usual, I have more than one. The Asteroid Field, you know which movie. Uh, John W., you know which W. No, he doesn't what? say that. No. <laughs> uh-huh. The final scene in Braveheart, James Horner as it, at his absolute best, weaving Scottish pipe themes in with grand orchestral. Music. He left a word, I think, out. Oh, okay. Just magnificent. This is a bit more obscure, but the scene at the tent pole moment when Captain Thorpe and his men escape the galley oars and steal the ship. It's such a great moment that they literally burst into song, so close to being cheesy, but Erich Wolfgang, Wolfgang Korngold's score is strong enough to make it work from the Seahawk. A very bravado uh, selection. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, great movie. Kelly Cooper goes right for my feels with, quote, the scene in Hudson Hawk where Bruce Willis <laughs> and Danny Aiello pick the song, swing it on a star, and then sing that while pulling cool. off a heist that is to cool. stay in sync with time, stay in sync time wise. End quote. Well, that is one of my favorite films. Yes, it is. Right up there with Ilsa, She Wolfly <laughs> SS. 
<laughs> you know, there's a great musical moment now. Never mind. No, there isn't. Thanks, Kelly. Meredith Gilchrist said, quote, the ending montage of La La Land, end quote. Oh. Have you seen La La Land? I have. Does it have a good ending montage scene? Eh. Eh, she likes it. Thanks, Meredith. Somewhat romantically, Aaron Perez offered, quote, Righteous Brothers Top Gun, end uh. quote. Thanks, Aaron. Charles Forsyth offered a response and a video clip, which I'm going to hold up and play for you now. No. Ooh, ah. He said, quote, I'm going with the Black Boys, White Boys song from Milos Forman's Hair. Oh, yeah. It's thanks. not my favorite song in the musical and not the best scene in the movie, but it cracks me up every single time it I watch it. It is a lot it. of fun. I had never seen it, and I watched it, and I was like, gay, 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 gay. Oh, very. <laughs> oh, boy. They, don't even, they aren't even pretending. Yeah. No, but it's funny because the, like, the actors who were supposed to be on the... Uh, I guess the army review board or whatever. It's the draft board. Look distinctly uncomfortable when yeah, they're talk, yeah. doing that stuff. But yeah. Anyway, back to Charles. The comic contrast of grim military draft board turning into a men's chorus singing the praises of sexy boys was creative genius, end quote. I'd never seen this, so thanks for both answer mm. and the clip, Charles. Tim Potter was next with, quote, For me, I would say it was when Star Wars Episode Four first came to theaters and all the theaters were upgrading the sound systems to Dolby, and when that opening music started oh. to play, you could just feel it in your bones, end quote. Yeah. Well, it seems like Johnny Williams has touched a lot of people. Just sit right back in your tail. <laughs> he actually didn't do that I theme. Know. He did I the incidental music. We have him to thank, thank for that. Stephen the Assistant sent a message that read, quote, Stephen the Assistant says, sit down, you're rocking the boat from Guys and Dolls, and oh. make them laugh from Singing in the Rain, end quote. Oh. Thanks, the Assistant. Both great songs. Steve Druckmann, first-time responder, came at us with, quote, diegetic or non-diegetic. If former, when Gene Hackman and Roy Scheider are in that speedy bar in French Connection, and who's performing? The Three Degrees. Everybody wants to go to the moon, which stands as commentary on the character's immediate surroundings as nobody's really listening. Nine diegetic too many to choose from, but hard to eclipse Simon and Garfunkel's soundtrack in The Graduate, end uh, quote. What's with these fancy terms? Yeah. Thanks, Ducky. Big, <laughs> big words. Yeah. Look okay. at you. What, you go to school or something? What are they good for? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Say it again. Mm. Dave, Dave! Is a bit more cryptic. Sort of. Quote, play it, Sam. If she can stand it, I can stand it, end uh. quote. He must be in that musical number in the middle of Life is Beautiful. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> you, you are like me. You really, really are like me. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Tony Merrill's more on the instrumental with, quote, the ending credits in Buckaroo Banzai in the Eighth oh, Dimension, end quote. It's I'm, a very catchy little tune. I never understood why they saved that until the end, you know? That's all right. It kept, it kept me in the theater. I yeah. kept watching the credits because, you know. Yeah. Well, thanks, Tony. Kate Potter offered, quote, home is behind the world ahead, end quote. And I admit, mm. I don't know what that refers to. I'm not to. sure either. I think that might be from one of the Lord of, Lord of the Rings movies, but I wouldn't swear to it. Mm. Don't swear. We, mm. We're, we're a family show. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. That's not all. Nope. We have answers from the website. Mm -hmm. Vince, Icebound. Brave as the day is crispy, chiseled out a message in the frozen air that read, quote, Two of my favorite unexpected musical moments are Annie Lennox singing Every Time We Say Goodbye in Edward II, and though not really unexpected, Bowie singing Heroes in Christian F. Wer Kinder von Bahnhof Zoo. Yeah, yeah, it's good. <laughs> because it was a pleasant break in a really depressing, heartbreaking film, end quote. This wasn't another Werner Herzog, was it, Vince? Actually, no. As I it am. turns out, <laughs> he found another depressing German uh, director. Oh, but... there are two? Come on. Yeah, only two. <laughs> <laughs> but Max, mm -hmm. what about your answer? Well, yes, what about your answer, Max? Can it compete with any of these? Thank you, Mr. Stidgen. <laughs> <laughs> That's a deeper. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, mine are much more simplistic. I didn't, uh, I mean, the, the background music and such, the, the non-diegetic music always tends to be more literal background for me. I don't pay as much attention. The, mm -hmm. My two examples are both the diegetic, I guess. One is the Marseillaise scene in Casablanca. Okay. Every, I've seen that so many times, I get chills every time. You know, Paul starts belting out Alonso Fonde. It's like, yeah. mm, so they're not even French. I know you're not French. No. Why do you care about France in these times? And the other one, just in terms of fun, is I like in the mask, the Cuban Pete dance oh. number. That's just so 
It's perfect for the character. It fits so well. It's so cartoony. I just really enjoy it. I am amazed nobody picked the Banana Boat song. Oh, from, from Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice. Yeah, yeah, that's another great one. Because that's a biggie. What about you? What, were your, what are your big ones? Well, um, actually, there's two of them from this week's movie. Really? So when they're driving down in their Barbie mobile, I guess, <laughs> yeah. and the Indigo Girl song comes uh, on, uh, uh, okay. when Closer I Am to Fine, that yeah. song gets me every time. Uh, okay. uh, but also in that movie, Billie Eilish's song. Which whose name I can't remember. What, what I was made for. Oh, yeah, I think that's what it. Is. Oh, oh, just hit me with a hammer, because dear oh. God, that song hits hard. But traditionally, Yoda's theme. Mm. Yoda's theme always gets me. Oh. And the give the Wookiee a medal scene in Star Wars. <laughs> it's a big dun da 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 because okay. yep. I like that too. Yep. But we love your answers. They're Thank great. you so much. There, you Even guys the ones think with too the big hard. Words, yeah, know. like diegetic. Stop being smart. Yeah. Because stuff, yeah. head hurt with the thing. You really bring a lot to our little show. But mm. speaking of shows, mm. we're going to want to know the answer to a question that involves one of the biggest shows ever. What movie do you think should have won the Best Picture Oscar oh. but didn't? Oh, boy. Let us know, won't you? Can't imagine why I'm asking that, wow. even though it's ahead of time. You just tossed a weasel into the hen house with that. Yeah, yeah. But let us know, won't you? Because you are great, and I am great. <laughs> but right now, we got <laughs> right now, we got to be great with something else. Barbie! Mm. The Facts. Budget. Somewhere between 128 and 145 million bucks. Who's uh, counting? It's a million here, a million there. Dear God, toys are expensive. Yeah. But take, wait for it, wait for it, nearly 1.5 billion dollars. Billion with a B. Hot Yikes. damn. It, does everything look out of scale? Well, that's because it is. Just like mm. the toys, all of the actors are a bit bigger than their accessories, so they'll look just as weird as the dolls do in relation to their stuff. Huh. 23% bigger, <laughs> to be exact. One might wonder why Ryan Gosling would take this role. Apparently, he saw his daughter's Barbie lying face down in the mud next to a lemon. He took a photo and sent it to director Greta Gerwig and said, I shall be your Ken. His story must be told. <laughs> Yeah, he's a, he's an interesting guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, The song, I'm Just a Ken, was written as a joke. Thing is, both Gerwig and Gosling liked it so much they decided it had to go into the movie. Huh. And a good thing, too. Yeah. There were two men who were just dying to be in this movie, Michael Cera and John Cena. The former emailed Gerwig out of the blue, got on a Zoom chat, and managed to convince her. Cena said he'd take any part in it and got Merman Ken. <laughs> See? Dreams Sarah, can come true. Sarah? Cena. Cena? Sarah. Cena? Sarah? <laughs> I'm shopping. Don't feel too badly for Alan. In real Barbie life, he and Midge, the pregnant Barbie, got married in 1990. Oh. And that's canon, folks. Barbie canon. Sure, <laughs> why not? It's pink. It's in the Barbie-verse. <laughs> There were real-life slumber parties. Sorry, Ken, you can't stay. For the actors, Barbie actors stayed together at a local London hotel, and every Sunday the cast would go to the movies to see films that related to what they were trying to make. I would be real interested to know what they watched. I'm pretty sure Life is Beautiful uh -huh. and Bear Herzog comedy <laughs> films and uh -huh. Ilsa She-Wolf of the yes, yes, and of course, a Deep House. And Rogue Warfare 3. Yep. Where did Ryan Gosling find inspiration for playing Ken? Why, the all-new Mickey Mouse Club. Where else? Oh, that's right. He, he was a Mouseketeer. He was. He was on that show when he was a kid, and he tapped into that inner child to help him play the role. He was quoted as saying, quote, I realized that I needed his help to make this movie, so I had to go back and make peace with him and ask for his help. It was good for me. And who's, who's help? His inner child. Oh, okay. Yeah. Greta Gerwig offered the role of Weird Barbie to Kate McKinnon. Her response? Oh, so it's a documentary. <laughs> I love you, Kate McKinnon. Apparently they met in, was it high school or earlier? They've been friends oh, wow. for a really long time. Nice. Yes. Believe it or not. I'm walking on air? No. no. Michael Sarah knows Kung Fu. <laughs> he oh. took classes when he played Scott Pilgrim, so he was able to show oh. off during Alan's fights with the work crew. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. This film was bigger than Batman. No, really. What? In its opening weekend, it took in over 26 million bucks. The Dark Knight only brought in a measly 24.5 million. Wow. Yeah. 
Margot Robbie was only originally the producer. Gal Gadot was supposed to play the title role, but wasn't available. Robbie gave total casting up to Gerwig, including that of the main character, but seriously, who else? Yeah, come on. Yeah. Who was that old lady at the bus stop? Oh, she was I playing, know, I know. Oh, who, who was it? That was Anne Roth. No, it was Anne Roth. <laughs> <laughs> and who was Anne Roth? Anne Roth was an Oscar-winning costume designer. Yes, she started in the business back in the 60s, and she was 91 when this scene was shot. Wow. While she didn't design costumes for Barbie, the scene was so important to Gerwig, she fought to keep it, stating, quote, if I cut the scene, I don't know what this movie is about, end mm. quote. So, good for her. She also won an Oscar for the costumes for Ma Raimi's Black Bottom. See, her, see our entire episode on Ma Raimi's Black Bottom. Cool. I mean, she's sort of like the Edith Head of today. Yeah. So now we need a new one because this one's wearing out. Yeah. And the big trivia. Mm -hmm. Only Ryan Gosling was nominated for an Oscar this year yeah. as well as um, America... Oh, America Fiera. America Fiera. Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie were yeah. not, even though the movie is up for Best Picture G... I'm sure that's just an oversight. It has nothing to do something. with the fact that only eight women have ever been nominated for Best Director, and only three have ever won in, what, 80 years? Mm, it might be more than that at this point. I think the first, mm. yeah, no, 1920, it's got to be. Yeah, yeah, but they only invented women 80 years ago. Oh, that's yeah, right. right. It's like gay people in the exactly. 70s. Okay, and black people in the 50s. Yep. All right. Um, so a little trivia about the Barbie doll herself, ah, because yes. it is connected. What's her full name? Barbara Jean Smathers? Nope. <laughs> Barbara Millicent Roberts. Okay. Mm -hmm. When was that ever put in a box? It was not on the box. It's a trivia thing I remember from the Netflix special, uh, The Toys That Made Us. Ah, so it's not actually canon, I see. It is canon. That was what Bar that's what uh, Ruth Handler said. It's Barbara Jean Smathers, and I wish I could remember where that Bar name came from. That is familiar. Isn't it? <laughs> well, write us in and tell like us who that Barbara is. Barbara Jean Smathers. I don't know. Yeah. As shown in the movie, Barbie was indeed an idea brought to American fruition by Ruth Handler. After watching her own daughter, Barbara, mm -hmm. play with dolls and imagine them in adult situations. No, not like that. <laughs> just like in careers. Adult situations. She, she decided that the plethora of baby dolls needed to make room for something different. She, her husband, Barbara, and son, Kenneth, let that sink in. We're traveling... <laughs> yeah, Ken suddenly gets much more murky. Ooh, yeah. They were traveling in Germany when she came across a German doll called Bilt Lily. It was really built. Now it's B-I-L-D. I believe it means color. Yeah. I should point out, Built Lily was based on a comic strip in yes, Germany. Yes, also called... Yeah. Bill, uh, yeah. What kind of character was Lily? Well, they, they were very vague about that in the uh, Wikipedia article. She seemed she to be a career girl. She was highly sexualized. There's implications she was a hooker. She had a career. <laughs> <laughs> she was a working girl, yes. She did. <laughs> in a working world. Mm -hmm. Unlike Barbie, she was more a gift for grown men, either to cheekily pose on their desks or to give to their girlfriends. It was that doll, lightly manipulated, that became the basis for the first Barbies. All rights and patents were acquired by Mattel, so it's fair there. Mm. Interestingly, when Ruth first brought the idea of an adult woman doll for kids, her husband, co-founder of Mattel, didn't like the idea. It wasn't until they found the Lily doll that he changed his mind. So, yeah, Ken sorta kinda isn't Barbie's boyfriend. He's sorta kinda her brother, if you want to extend the metaphor. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, enough of that. Unless, Max, do you have something to add for trivia? Uh, just want to point out, Ruth Handler was the CEO of Mattel for 30 years. She basically held on to Barbie with a death grip. She wouldn't let anyone else uh, deal with it. She was tough as nails. She did, as they mentioned in the movie, it's a throwaway line. She had breast cancer. She had a double mastectomy. She didn't like any of the breast implants that were available for reconstructive surgery at the oh, time. Oh, no. She designed her own. Oh, I thought you were going to say she had some made by Mattel. No, no. <laughs> she designed her own. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm going to take a wild guess. Could that be possibly be because all the other ones were designed by, oh, I don't know, men? Could be. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and she didn't want uh, breasts that would cause her spine to snap. Uh, yeah, well. And then eventually, later in life, she became Rhea Perlman. <laughs> but... Onto the uh, hmm. onto the plot. Okay, so we're in Barbie Land, the uh, make believe world where all the Barbies live, have great days, do everything from walk on the beach to travel in space, be the president, judge, and try cases in court. Oh, oh, sure. There's Ken too. He and his other Kens are, are there, and they do things too, like stand around and look pretty and vie for Barbie's attention. 
But our Barbie, stereotypical Barbie, is starting to have an emotional crisis. Seems she's starting to question things like death? <laughs> Wait, what? And things start changing for her. No longer is everything perfect to her. Her tiptoe stance flattens. Her hair isn't just right. And those existential thoughts just won't go away. So Barbies tell her it's time to go see Weird Barbie, a Barbie who is played with too hard by her real-life girl. And, like Morpheus, Weird mm. Barbie tells S. Barbie she has two choices, one of which is that she forgets everything, and the other is that the only way for her to fix things is to travel to the real world, find her girl, and straighten things out. But really, it's only the second choice, or wink and have any picture. Ken, feeling a little left out, stows away in Barbie's amazing Corvette, and they travel together to... Venice Beach. And there, they are slapped in the face by the real world. Ken, who's been feeling a little ignored by Barbie and the world run by women, finds out about something magical called the patriarchy. <coughs> Beer, trucks, and horses. Barbie, meanwhile, has broken some sort of giant Mattel rule by breaching the boundary between worlds. The executives chase and capture Barbie, trying to lure her back in the box before things get out of hand. But it's too late for that because Ken has taken his new knowledge back to Barbie land and transformed it into his own Kendom, brainwashing all the Barbies into thinking it's just great to be subservient to men, waiting on their every need, and taking only minor roles in the world. Finding out about this, Barbie races back to try and set everything straight before Barbie land is irrevocably and horribly changed. Oh, uh, and the movie's not about anything I've just said at all, but we'll get to that. <laughs> but only if I say the end here. Mm -hmm. the, end. the end. But not... Really? Yeah. Yeah. The film. So, yeah, I left a large part of this out because, quite honestly, the recap would have been the next 10 minutes. Yeah. And a lot, there's a lot in this movie. Yeah. First question I always like to ask Yeah. Did you see this when it came out? Not when it came out in the oh. theaters. Yeah, I thought you did see it in the nope. theater. No, oh. I, saw, I saw it when it hit streaming. I did. Um, yeah. Actually, uh, Dr. Professor Rebecca Pelkey yeah. was visiting and said she wanted to see it. And I was like, sure, why not? Let's mm. go. So I went. Okay. Now, if I remember correctly, uh, off mic, you've said you've seen this more than once before the show. Yeah, I had cool. seen it twice before uh, we actually watched it together. That's a lot to do for a movie you hate. <gasps> oh, <laughs> dang. Uh, darn women. <laughs> Well, yeah. Next, the, next thing you know, they'll want to vote. <laughs> well, and speaking of uh, women, I'm not going to use your term. Let's get to the cast, which is mostly mm -hmm. women, and that's fine. Uh, we do have a slight problem, one oh, we've um, <laughs> never had on Max Mike movies yeah. before. Most of the characters that are female are named Barbie. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to, to isolate. It's like, oh, you remember her playing Barbie? Oh, no, I liked her playing Barbie. Yeah, no, no, she was better at Barbie. Yeah. yeah. Not the Barbie wasn't no, but, as good. I but. mean, we got the main ones, of course, Margot Robbie as stereotypical Barbie. Uh, and I'd only seen her in clips playing um, Harley Quinn. Uh, what's her name? Harley Quinn. Harley Quinn, yeah. That's you mean, it. you saw The Suicide Squad. I know. And yeah. Oh, that's right. She's in that yes, playing Harley is. Quinn. I just didn't like the movie very she, much. Yeah. Um, see our entire episode on justice whatever and you know she's fine i guess in that this role it's a role that will surprise you why because she's playing a doll mm -hmm. and she's not playing a doll yeah it's this is gonna be a tough movie to talk about it is i but first of all physically she can she's barbie i yeah. mean she's beautiful blue eyes blonde hair incredible figure well the well, hair wasn't actually hers. It well, was a, I think it's a series of forty ten thousand dollar wigs. Wow. Yeah. It's okay. She still. She is still. She looks like Barbie even without the wig. Yeah. Uh, and she does the physicality that she uses, where she sometimes will move like a person, and sometimes, like when she's fall when she falls down and just gives up, she moves exactly the way you would move a doll, rolling over, the knees not bending. There was apparently one thing that they originally talked about doing physically that they found it was just too hard, and that was not separating their fingers. Oh, there's no <laughs> way that would work. They said they tried it, and there were too many people who weren't good at it that yeah, it just didn't work. That so would have been really I, hard. I forget in the trivia, there was one actor who did do it the entire film, and I can't remember who it was. But, oh, wow. Yeah. And when they wave, their hand is oh, hands are always positioned the way Barbie's hands are, with the wrist slightly cocked. Yeah. Yep, it's, it's very impressive. She's almost doing the elbow, elbow, wrist, wrist, wrist. wrist, wrist. Yeah. yeah, not the uh, pearls two three, wave yeah. two three. 
Uh, she, yeah, she does a great job as Barbie. Um, we'll come back to her. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Issa Rae as Barbie. I think she's President Barbie. I believe Barbie. she's President Barbie. Tiny part in that case, but she does fine. She does, and she actually has a she has real presence when she's there. You like, okay, yeah, this is authority figure Barbie. Yeah, but you know the really sad thing about her as President Barbie? What? I'd vote for her. <laughs> Over what we've got going on now? Yeah, so would I. Yeah. I was like, can we have that? I want her. <laughs> Kate McKinnon is weird Barbie. Oh. Um, I don't... She's really perfect Kate, as weird Barbie. Kate McKinnon's a friggin' treasure. She tent... I will say this. I, I will admit, she doesn't have a lot of range. She mostly does that weird, off-kilter, sort of adorable crazy. Mm-hmm. But she's really good at picking the parts where that fits. Yeah. And this, I think, may be her best. I, I think she did. She was a lot of fun. She really uh, was. Uh, apparently, there were times when she did do the splits and times when there was a stunt double and times when there was a plastic leg. <laughs> Which, to be fair, I'm glad there was because yeah. there's times when she... painful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's lots of other oh, yeah. Barbies in here. It's um, Har Hari Neff, who is a transgender actor. Which was really interesting. It turns out I did not know this. There was a transgender Barbie. Really? Yes, there was. And it wasn't that long ago, which oh, is also not that a surprise. That doesn't surprise me, yeah. But, and I also really like the fact that they don't... They don't like, make a thing about nope, it? Nope. They don't make... They don't shine a light. Nothing. It's just... I wanted to see Proust Barbie. The, well, technically, <laughs> the one of them was supposed to sort of be Proust Barbie, but... What? Oh, really? The one who was, who, who was winning the um, oh, Nobel Prize for uh, literature. Oh, oh, he, oh, yeah, he says, yo, oh, sounds like Proust Barbie. Oh, that did not sell well. Yeah, well, there's, there's a lot of that in Barbie's history, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Uh, I mean, there's a there's a bunch of like hidden celebrities in there too. You know, the pop star Dua Lipa. I don't she, know her, but yeah, she she's pretty big these days. She's in there. The guy, I cannot pronounce his name properly, but he's the guy who's playing the new Doctor Who. He's one of the Kens. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. it's uh, oh boy, Kudi Gatwa. Yeah, he and the thing is, is apparently he found out about getting Doctor Who while on the set. And Ryan Gosling is a huge Doctor Who fan, so mm -hmm. apparently Ryan Gosling was geeking out like crazy. Of course, we got John Cena as the mermaid, <laughs> the merman, merman. Excuse me, and Emerald Fennel. She's Midge. Yeah, uh, pregnant. Midge. Pregnant Midge. Yes, excuse. Me. And Simu Liu, Shang Chi, Shang Chi is is another Ken. And I'm sorry, during the fight scenes, I'm like, oh, this is already over. <laughs> Come on. I would just thought he was really cute, but that's just me. Oh, he's friggin' gorgeous. Yeah, and he's built nice, too. It doesn't mm -hmm. hurt. We have, of course, uh, as, as another... Oh, actually, he was Alan. We have Michael Sarah, who, oh, that, if you want moist Barbie, this... <laughs> He was, he was. I thought he was really good as as uh, Alan. I thought he just, he nailed it. Yeah, he did honestly what he usually does. His He's sort moist, of soft and wet <laughs> at it. <thing. laughs> he but, feels like a paper towel slightly soaked in milk. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I just like the little lines. You know, there are no multiples of Alan. He's just Alan, and he just yeah, confused about that. <laughs> He's also the only one uh, of the in Barbie Land who swears. Well, excuse me, who swears without having it bleeped? Because the yeah. president says, yeah, you know, mother effers. But he says Christ at one point. Oh. Christ, turn that song off. Well, now that's not swearing. That's blasphemy. That's yeah, different. It's very strange for one of those sort of characters. That's true. But, yeah, he, he's hilarious, I, I think. And I, honestly, I wanted to see more of Alan because he was It's like, okay, so he's Ken's best friend. But Ken, I don't think Ken ever speaks to him. I don't think any of the Kens talk to him at any yeah. point. And you can tell, like, Alan's shorter than Ken, like, mm -hmm. in real life, doll life. Mm -hmm. And Ken is the guy that you have to have on your baseball team, because otherwise you're going to have an odd number. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That's the other thing. You look at Ken, well, you look at any of the Kens, and you look at Michael Sarah, and that line he uses, I can wear all of Ken's clothes... No, you can't. Well, you can, you can, you but can. you they, shouldn't. They would hang on you like a tent. Yes. yes. And then there's and, some other guy in this film. I'd never heard of him before. Mm -hmm. Ryan... Uh, oh, yeah. Bird Goss something. something. Yeah. Ryan Gosling is starting to work my last nerve. Uh-oh. Uh oh Are we having a whole other uh, Kevin Don't Klein syndrome? Name, <laughs> don't name the Dark Prince. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last time you saw Kevin Klein in anything? I saw him in an off-Broadway production of Something in the Air, and he friggin' killed it. And when was that? That was about eight years ago. Well, there you go. I think you're fine. Mm. But now Ryan Gosling? Ryan Gosling... I have I'm not sure yet 
because I don't know how much of it he sings. I know he sings the song I'm Just Ken, but you know who's backing him up on that? No. Friggin' Slash oh. from Guns N' Roses and Wolfgang Van Halen, son of Edward. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Really? So Eddie? he's got really? some help. You know? <laughs> yeah, Wolfgang. Yeah, why don't you just name him Hold My Head in the Toilet Van Halen? Van Halen. Oh, come on, the Van Halen really kind of carries. Uh, yes. it, it's better than the Wolfgang. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, he takes his part and just runs with it. And quite does. honestly, Ryan Gosling is not an actor that I particularly enjoyed. He's somebody who always seems to have this little smirk and sometimes at inappropriate parts like, oh, I don't know, Blade Runner 2049. Yeah, but he does a, re- a remarkable job in um, La La Land, which is not a movie I particularly liked, but he and Emma Stone were really good. Yeah. And wow, in this, i got to say, I do understand why he got nominated for the Oscar. Yeah. He has an incredibly difficult job. Ken has to be both pathetic, annoying, unlikable, and sympathetic. Mm. And he does it. Oh, you forgot one. Hmm? Stacked. Stacked. <laughs> Ripped. Because, <laughs> um, quite honestly, Ryan Gosling has never looked better. Yeah. And it's, um, it made me uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ryan Gosling looks burnished in this. He's actually more hypersexualized than any of the Barbies. Very like, yeah, yeah. Like, all of them, even when they're wearing swimsuits and stuff, it's more like Sunday Circular type stuff. Yeah, they're wearing but, like one pieces and they have like overshirts or some such, and he's out there, oh my vest God. and no shirt. Yeah, gay. <laughs> you said it, not me. Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a Ken party going on, and they're not going to film that. Yeah, yeah. I, and the other part that's really surprised me a little is one we don't see, and that's the narrator. Helen Mirren. Helen friggin' Mirren. Dame Helen Mirren. And it's funny because I'm not usually good with voices, Mm -hmm. but she comes on and is like, oh, it's Helen Mirren. Like, I did know it was her. Yeah. And she brings a very interesting tone and note to this film because she's kind of letting us know from the start that, yeah, it's about Barbie, but it's not really about Barbie. Yeah. But don't get too serious. But really, maybe you should. Yeah, that's one of the confusing parts. Also, she just... You know, fourth wall? What fourth wall? She actually names the actress in this. You know, she, she said, does. When when Margot Robbie is giving that actually very moving speech about how she does the, you know, she's not pretty and she's not stereotypical Barbie pretty anymore. Note to the filmmakers, Margot Robbie is not the person to cast for this <laughs> message. I know, right? Yeah. I'm not beautiful. Just please stop, shut up. Stop it. Shut the stop it up. Stop it. All right, fine. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah. So it's it's a cast that ranges from really took things and ran with it to very good. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's no there's no. not a weak point in the. It's just that there's a whole, I mean, <coughs> let's face it there's a whole bunch of Barbies and a whole bunch of Kens, and that you can't all stand out. There's just too many people. Oh, we also forgot we forgot Will Ferrell. Yeah, Will Ferrell. <laughs> who I have to say, what is he doing in this movie? Honestly. I don't get it. I don't. He's to me one of the most confusing of the real world characters. I don't find him confusing until the end, mm. and I think that his his final like his, and it's not his playing the character. It's what's written for him. I can't quite figure out where, what poker he's got in the fire. Mm. It's kind of he's a little weird. But we're gonna get back to he's that. Playing at first like a watered down version of Lord Business from the Lego Movie, but he's not. He's because he's not really evil. No, well, let's get back to him. Yeah, I also want to. Give a shout out. America Ferreira is terrific. She is. And um, do you have it up for the Who Plays Sasha? Yes, Ariana Greenblatt, who t- is amazing. The two of them have such a great chemistry. And it's not that they start off, oh, they love each other, they're mom and daughter. It's very much they were that, and she's a moody teen. Yeah. And something's happened, probably hormones, yeah. maybe something else, we don't know. Mm-hmm. But the way they don't get along yeah. and then get back together is actually one of the nicest parts of the film. It's also completely believable. Believable and it feels earned, even yeah. if it was a little fast, but yeah. that's all right. Ariana Greenblatt, by the way, uh, she plays the young version of Ahsoka in the uh, oh. so- Ahsoka series, and she was in 65 with Adam Driver, a part where she almost she has almost no dialogue. Oh. And she, this is a girl to watch. Hmm. She, when, when she gets older, she's going to be terrifying. Huh. Cool. Yeah, she's be- very cool. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, sure. sure you, did. you didn't hear anything here. Not first, a thing. Except Max's gas. Mm, yeah. uh, there is a little twist in this film, and I'd kind of like to not talk about it. I think we'll be okay with it. Okay. And I think the reason for that, the only reason is because this film's not even a year old. And I think there are people out there who should see this yeah. movie who may not have seen it yet. Mm -hmm. Now, should you see it because... All this money is very poorly spent and <laughs> is quite honestly not the thing you're thinking of, or because it's really good. We'll get to that at the end. Yeah. But there's a little little, little twist mm. with involving Barbie that I want to leave out. Okay. Um, when the film starts, though, it's good to know that it's Mattel, because if it's Mattel, they make movies swell. <laughs> <laughs> really. that yeah. I could see people, when that credit popped up and you just see the Mattel logo... People just think, I need to go. Yeah, yeah. It's a toy movie. It's a Why toy movie. Here? Well, yes, it's going to be like Battleship. Or, oh boy, I was going to go to Transformers, but you took it a step uh, down. Yeah, no, no. Transformers is Citizen Kane compared to Battleship. I mean, personally, I'm on the edge of my seat waiting for the Kerplunk movie. Because <laughs> I, I want to see Hungry, Hungry Hippos, the movie. <laughs> Yeah. Or Ganip Ganop. Yeah. <laughs> Ganip Ganop. Wow. So you nip down to your toy it. store to get the game before it's all Ganoped. I liked that game. Yeah. Uh, I, the opening scene, hey, yeah, we're still parodying 2001 A Space Odyssey because why not? But yeah. boy, that little girl is so angry. She, she was great. She had so much energy and she's flinging the doll into space. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. And yes, that is. When we see first see Barbie, she is wearing the first outfit that Barbie was ever sold with, the black and white swimsuit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's it's weird how mores have changed, and it's like that bathing suit's like, yeah, whatever. And back then was probably was, really, really racy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they point out, you know, it's true. The narrator points out, historically, up, up, up until Barbie, pretty much in every culture... Dolls were always babies. The gut dolls for girls, which were pretty much the only dolls, were always babies for them to play mother with. I'm, I'm going to take a wild guess and mm -hmm. say that this was an idea made up by, um, what's that word? Um, men. Yeah, very likely. To basically just corner women into the idea that that's what their life should be about. Mm. So, and I think that is one of many comments this film might be trying to make. What do you think? I think it's entirely possible. Yeah. There is a really weird but good mix of fantasy and reality in this film. Mm. Because we start off in Barbie land where everything is Barbie-rific and um, everyone's Barbie. Everything's pink. Everything is that pink. Yep. Apparently, <laughs> this film actually caused a shortage of that color paint. <laughs> like, there was a worldwide, we don't have any pink in Vault right now because Barbie used it. it all. But it's the Barbies themselves, and I, I definitely want to come back to the metaphor, because that's going to be a little later on. But there's definitely a hint right from the start that the bar Barbies are not oblivious of things beyond their boundaries. Mm -hmm. Because, well, sort of. They know the real world exists, but they have this very distorted view of what it is. They think that because everything in their world is female-run, the real world is, too. Again, we'll come back to that, but you, but they have things like courts and lawyers yes. and stuff as opposed to just a Barbie named a lawyer with a briefcase, and the little girls would know what that was. Yeah. So it's like they're both playthings, but they're not the mind of a child entirely not either. Not entirely, because one of the first things we see is the Supreme Court, right. or their Supreme Court, and one of the lawyer there is arguing a real court issue is the Citizens United court case in 2010 that made corporations People yeah. legally, yeah. One of which many have said it, uh, it was a huge mistake. Huge mistake, but it was a pl it was adding on to a ruling in the 1990s that started this. This basically codified it and kind of broke things. But yeah, that's that's I don't think something you get a lot of eight year old girls discussing. I wouldn't think so. Mm, or eight to know. twelve, or however they. I don't yeah. know. Um, and then we. Get <laughs> Get to Ken, who's um, his job is beach. <laughs> I, I do like that. That kills me. And then he. And I'm not a lifeguard. That, no, I'm not qualified. I, 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 I'm just beach. Yeah, I beach. And then he meets another Ken, and they have yep. a beach off. And they're threatening I'm gonna to beat you off. They beat you off. It's like stop saying that. <laughs> I think at that moment I realized, okay, this movie is really, really not. Maybe not even at all for children. I don't know. <laughs> the thing that amazes me is that somebody at Mattel, some group of people, man, yeah. would have to have approved this script before it was made. I would assume, and it points out, like, 
The fact that the entire board of directors of, of Mattel, at least in the movie, I don't know about in real life, are all men. Right. Now, there's also a point that comes a little later on when they make it to Venice Beach mm. and the question of the um, sexual nature of Barbie and Ken comes up and they are both fully aware that nine of them has genitalia. Yeah. Except Although Ken said, I, I have all the genitals. <laughs> <laughs> so there is this weird mix, especially when we get existential crisis Barbie with magic hair. <laughs> I, I like when it's another thing where the fourth wall breaks when, oh lord, I knew who this was to whoever's singing the theme song Pink. Okay. When she's like P, you know, perfect. You know, K, cool. <laughs> and then toward, when Barbie's having her crisis she's like, you know, P, panic. I, you know, K, death. death. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> uh, it's a, referring to a German word meaning death. Uh. No, it's not. <laughs> you know, death with a K. Yeah, and uh, speaking of that Barbie song, it's really catchy. Yeah. And it's not alone, because I honestly thought the Ken song is really catchy, Ken song too. It is very catchy, and the dance number, and I'm really annoyed to find that Ryan Gosling appears to be able to dance as well. Well, mm. I mean... Simu Liu, I knew, could dance. Mm. <laughs> Well, and I would say if, even if you're able to overlook the weird, less than childlike references that Barbies are making, as soon as we get to weird Mar Barbie, the movie starts adulting. Yeah, right. It, it really does start to show you. No, this is this is the adult perspective on it. Yes, the Barbie, and I like the idea that she represents all weird Barbies right. because at one point Gloria says, "Oh, I had a weird Barbie." Yeah. So I do have a question for you. Mm. Where um, where, where does Ken live? Nobody knows. Even <laughs> Barbie doesn't know. None of them know. I mean, they she they ask where do the Kens live, and she's just like, I don't know. <laughs> and eventually, you know, they take over the dream houses, and Ken turns one into his Ken's Mojo jo Dojo, Dojo Casa, Casa House. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the the, mo the most fun and most disturbing things about Ken is he is a large child. Everything his every, all of his reactions are childlike, except for the fact that he wants to have sex with Barbie, or at least I don't think he wants to have no, sex. That's true. I think he just wants to be. He wants well, to, we'll come back to this. Yeah. Technically, what he really wants is he wants to be equals with Barbie. He wants her to love him. Right. He doesn't care. I don't know if he cares about equality. The others talk about that. He wants to be seen. He wants to be important. I mean, the narrator says Ken only has a good day if Barbie looks at him. And I think he wants to be respected. Yeah. Which he's not. He Let's, isn't. Uh, this is, we'll come back, I want to come back to the metaphor totally, but I think it's very interesting and very even-handed for the movie to say, yeah, women can do this too. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're living in a patriarchal society. Most of the stuff, the bad behavior we see is per, on perpetuated against women is because of men and because of the way society is, is set up. But that being said... There are probably circumstances where women treat men the same way. It could it's just in a similar. You don't know. Yeah, but uh, we don't know where where Ken lives. Um, I'm picturing a giant Ken pile, but there you go. <laughs> and again, Ken's more hypersexualized than Barbie. Mm. Um, those pants are riding really low, and you may tell me that it's just a big plastic bulge, but I don't believe you. Um, it's the thing. He, oh, he it's like he tried. He wants to be sexual, but he doesn't know what it is. I mean, well, she not. asks at one. He says, "You know, maybe I could stay over," and she says, "Why?" And he goes, "I don't know." <laughs> he just knows he's supposed to. Well, he's her boyfriend, right? Yeah. That's how it says on the box, right? right. Except for magic earring, Ken, but we won't talk about him. <laughs> he was those were two, magic earring. <laughs> uh, no, it's earring magic, Ken. It's I looked it up. It's not magic earring. It's earring magic, Ken. Yeah, wearing a cock ring on. Ooh, oh. oh. <laughs> Hey, oh. I'm sorry, that's what it is. <laughs> the one I had never heard of, and I looked, and this is also real, Sugar Daddy Ken. Yeah. Although, on some of the, it's written Sugar's Daddy, with an apostrophe sure. S. Because it's supposed to be, oh no, see, this is my dog Sugar, I'm her daddy. Was the apostrophe S written with a Sharpie? Uh, <laughs> might have been. Don't know. But yeah, so we have this, this little... Um, reference to The Matrix, where hmm. Weird Barbie gives S. Bar I'm just going to call her S. Barbie because it's easier. Yeah. Gives S. Barbie a choice between shoes. She can have the high-heeled shoe and, and go back to forgetting everything, or she can have a Birkenstock. <laughs> and I love the fact that it's like, no, we're going to do this again. You're going to because S. Barbie chooses. <laughs> I, she literally the says, "I just gave you a choice so you'd feel some sense of control." Yeah, 
By the way, that's a real theme in this movie that I, I have to say is one of the problems I have with it. Oh, one of the problems, because of course there's a lot, right? Well, no, this is the main one. Okay. They treat us like we're, we're bloody idiots. Who? The movie treats us like we're idiots. The audience are stupid. Because they, they spell everything out. Everything. Do you think there might be a reason for that? Yeah, might be. They're talking <laughs> down to us the way men talk down to women. Or perhaps they don't think that many of the men watching this will get the point. That's also <laughs> possible. But like when she's talking about when Barbie is discovering being self-conscious. She says, I'm really aware of myself, but I'm very conscious of it. Mm -hmm. And Ken is saying, yes, I, I feel it, but I just feel admired. She says, yeah, mine has an undertone of violence. Yeah. Like, yeah, okay, that's very uncomfortable, but I get it. I actually really appreciated that perspective because as I watch the last 10 years, the way men are portrayed in movies, in advertising and stuff, it has become much, much more sexualized. Hmm. And it's so, I swear, sometime around the turn of the century, around the year 2000, somebody just decided, hey, you know what? Men can be sexy. <laughs> we should maybe sell that. Oh, come on. No, I had that back in the 80s and 90s. You remember the Diet Coke commercial with the Not guy with Not nearly as much as we do now. Eh. Trust me, because... There used to be this wanting and this never having, i.e., uh. oh, I hope this character takes his shirt off, and it was never a thing, right? Trust me, there wasn't a thing. Now it's like we actually have actors. I'm trying to think of which actor I read about this recently. It was, oh, um, Taylor, Lor uh, Taylor Lautner, who's like, I'm really tired of having roles where I take my shirt off. I don't want to be just considered as something sexual. It's oh. like, oh, um, I wonder who else feels that way. Who <laughs> might, hmm. And I think, and I think some guys are totally fine with it. Mm. It's like, oh, you want to look at me? Yeah, drink me in. I'm pretty hot, and that's fine. Yeah. But they don't realize that a lot of women don't like that. Well, as they, as Barbie and Ken point out, with with men, there's less of the question of violence. There is, men aren't as worried that they're going to be raped. Right. Whereas women, it's a very real possibility. Right. And to be fair, it does happen. Yeah, it but, absolutely happens. But it is not. It, the same. The, the ratio. The ratio the is tiny. Yeah. The number of men. It is true. Men are sexually assaulted too, but it's a fraction of the number. And it's funny because one of my notes was I got echoes of Star Trek and Fat Albert from this. Fat and, Albert. And if you're not careful, you just might learn something. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> now you do it better. Um, it, in in that way, it sort of reflects back on your point that things are really spelled out. Yeah. I personally didn't mind that because if that's what it takes. That's what it takes. Yeah. And I think that there's plenty of people who are just, there's watching this going, why are we watching these dolls? They're really stupid. Uh, I don't get it. Like, why? I like horses. I like trucks. What's the problem? It's like, okay. <laughs> I, I do like Ken's line. You know, actually, when I figured out that the patriarchy wasn't about horses, I kind of lost interest. <laughs> You know, he actually sort of, for an instant, seems to fall in love with toxic male masculinity. Yeah. I personally don't get the horses thing. I know way more women who are into horses oh, than no, men ever were. Oh, it's a big male symbol. The Marlboro Man, the cowboy. Yeah, but they don't want the horse. They want the power. Yeah. It's the, yeah, yeah. That, that's it's, part of it. Well, it represents power. And virility. Yes, <laughs> yes. Horses are yes. hung like um, <laughs> them. Them. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's some interesting when he's like going through that building and he's seeing the photo montage of mm -hmm. masculine images, and one of them is Bill Clinton. It's like, ouch! Yeah. Okay, that's on target. Only a little. <laughs> I think it's because they're referencing the saxophone. Oh, the sure. saxophone, as you well know, is a symbol of male um, musicality. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and I, Barbie brings up an interesting point when he comes back and basically infects Barbie Land. Mm -hmm. And turns it into Kendom. Yeah. And Barbie doesn't understand, how did this happen so fast? Why are all these powerful women? And Gloria says, oh, God, it's like the indigenous people in the 1500s and smallpox. They had no natural defense for it, so it affected them way more. Yeah, this to me is, has to do with the metaphor, and I would like to come back to that because mm -hmm. I think we're going to spend a bit of time on that. And there's a few other things I definitely would like to get to. Mm -hmm. One of them is that little old woman in the bus stop scene. Mm. That is a beautiful little scene. And I totally understand why Greta Gerwig was like, no, this scene has to be in the yep. movie. It doesn't add mm. to the plot. No. It doesn't in any way shore up the values of anything else except this woman's. They said Barbie is sitting there and she sees this old woman. And just stares at her. Well, and the likelihood is she's never seen an old woman before. Yeah. Why would she? And then she, the, instead of saying anything else, 
like, oh, do those hurt? That's Logan's run. Yeah. She just says, you're beautiful. And the you're woman so says... You're so beautiful. She's just awestruck. Yeah. And the woman says, I know it. And it's like, that is such an awesome scene. And I got to say, that is another thing where I think it was criminal that Margot Robbie didn't get nominated because that scene could have been so dumb. Yeah. That could have been ruined if the delivery was any less perfect than mm-hmm. what she does. That awe and wonder in her voice and in her face and she you know the one tear going down her her cheek. Yeah. It's because that could have been silly yeah. or condescending and it isn't. And even better, they end it right yep, there. They, just they don't There's explain anything. No, con- no further conversation. Mm-hmm. Ken runs up being dopey. Well, that's what he's there for. There is one. There is something in here that does kind of bother me too. Mm-hmm. And there is still this underlying idea of this movie being used to sell more toys. Because mm-hmm. let's face it, that's one of the main hopes of Mattel, right? Like you know, we- they put out a weird Barbie after this movie. Yeah, which kind of. It misses the point entirely. Which is perfectly indicative of corporate America. Yeah. Missing the point. Yeah. Movie. Yeah. That did kind of bother me, because mm-hmm. I'm sure that there were... I didn't look into this, but I'm sure that there were movie-based special Barbies that came out, and they were collectible, probably bought up by 30, 40-something-year-old <laughs> And never men. taken out of the box. Right. Uh, and that's that, to me, is kind of sad, because... Yeah, that's unfortunate. It's true. That, that makes absolute sense. good or bad fail or, or succeed, this film is really not about that at all. Of, of all the things it's about, and it's about a lot of things, that's not one of them. Mm. The toys really aren't. They're in there. I had a couple of quotes I had in here. Okay. Some of which are a little bit on, on the nose. Mm-hmm. One of them was, quote, oh, I'm a man with no power. Yeah. Does that make me a woman? <laughs> and quote, ouch. Ouch. <laughs> oh, this there, they, somebody actually says the uh, some of my best friends are Jewish line, and I was like, <laughs> wow, okay. I still like just, it's a throwaway, but one of the Kens, when they've all changed into macho, goes, I have hat. <laughs> Do you notice, by the way, in the Ken song, they're even singing stupid? Because there is a line. I didn't catch this the first two times I saw this. But he says, the one line says, my name's Ken, and they all respond, and so am I. <laughs> So is mine. They get it wrong, and so am I. <laughs> yeah. Um, I one uh, one point Ken says horses are men extenders. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> okay, sure. I also like new depre- new depression Barbie. She's gonna watch the BBC Pride and Prejudice for the seventh time. <laughs> She's eaten a family sized bucket of Starburst, and now her jaw aches. <laughs> I'm gonna wear my pajamas eleven days row. Okay, depression. <laughs> There's one where. Um, <laughs> It's a quote, I was in a dream where I was actually interested in the Snyder cut of JLA. <laughs> well, I, and Alan's line was it, it's not the first time an Alan's escaped. All of InSync, Alan's, yes, including him. <laughs> How about the Ken's response when Barbies are pretending to, to need help? Here, oh. let us show you. Oh, that, oh, God. Or, I'll play the guitar at you. At you. <laughs> and what is the song that they love? It's Matchbox 20's uh, Push. Yeah. Which I thought is a very catchy song, but if you listen to the lyrics, <laughs> it's, awful. it's pretty nasty. Yeah. Oh, God. I, up till now, I only knew the Weird Al part version of that. <laughs> I, I love the fact that, you know, the Barbies are manipulating the Kens by playing to their, their egos and pretending to be helpless. And what do they do? It's computer helplessness. Needing the Godfather explained. I actually wrote all this down. Oh, my God. Being confused about money, pretending to be terrible at sports, and wearing glasses. <laughs> it's like, wow, I don't think they missed a trick. Well, the funny thing is is that until I watched The Godfather for our show, see uh-huh. the entire episode on The Godfather, I didn't know that was a thing. Oops, excuse me. Oh, boy, is uh, it? Apparently, there are some guys that are just into The Godfather. And they it's, just it's need a, to explain. It's a brilliant movie. It... It's not, you know, a divine sending from above. But. Although we do get to see one of them start to talk about it, and it is pretty funny. Yeah. Because, yeah. I also like when the Kens are returning once the Barbies have taken over, taken their dream houses back. They're Monty Python and the Holy Grailing their way along because <laughs> they're miming riding horses. I wanted so much to have somebody with a pair of coconuts. Yeah. Well, Barbie didn't ever made coconuts, so there you go. That must oh, be what it going is. back to the song Push, I do like, but there's a callback. When Barbie is talking to Ken at the end, she says, I'm sorry I took you for granted. 
Yeah. Which is that line, you know, I want to take but you will, for granted. But I will, but I will. I won't take you for granted. Yeah. And I will, and I will. <laughs> I want to push you around. Anyway, a uh, couple of uh, things, one thing I noticed, apparently Chevy is a sponsor of this film yeah, because yeah. all of the vehicles all in this curves. film are Chevys, yeah. <laughs> which is fine. I really actually like that blue one. I don't like SUVs, but the one that... That's um, a crossover. I think that's a CUV. Yeah, it was actually kind of neat. It was very right nice. Um, yes, you needed a horse on it, though. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I do like when, I guess they're... Um, Suburbans, those big black suburbans pull oh, up. Oh, dear God, they're gigantic. Should I get, you know, she's getting into that scary black, black truck car that I kind of want. <laughs> <laughs> there were some things I thought also were interesting that even though Barbie's in charge in the beginning of the film, mm -hmm. there's still this big emphasis on appearances. Oh, yeah. Like it's not. They're not trying. This isn't the point where appearance is trying to please men. It's just Barbies are like. There's this whole strata of you have to look good and, and seem like you're feeling good. And whoever, whoever's in power, doesn't matter who it is in Barbie Land, hides and buries their emotions. Like mm -hmm. that's, which is interesting because that's usually considered a male thing. My guess mm -hmm. is it's a response to the fact that anytime women show emotion, men think they're just going crazy or yeah. it's that time of the month. Because, of course, women aren't allowed to have emotions no. and that means they're irrational. Uh, whereas men, of course, are always rational and, uh, uh -huh. yeah. So. What do you think of America Ferreira's, you know, speech? The what? The so tired, it's so hard. It's impossible to be a woman. Can I go back first? Sure. Because I do want to do that. I want to go back mm -hmm. to Sasha's speech. Okay. Oh, we just we have a new Barbie. It's called Bitch Slap Barbie. <laughs> so Barbie shows Ouch. up and she's trying to find her girl, mm -hmm. and she believes it's Sasha. So she goes. She finds Sasha's school somehow. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how. Yeah, well. And basically, Sasha lays down what she believes Barbie has done to womankind. Yeah. And that speech, oh, it's still stinging. Do you feel it? Yeah, I feel it. Yeah. Ow. That's yeah, really painful. But she basically says, you uh, hypersexualize women. You compartmentalize them. Your you... rampant consumerism is destroying the planet. She calls her a fascist. Yeah, which I didn't quite get. But I didn't either, but obviously it was Obviously, this 12-year-old girl who just heard the word somewhere. But then we, and I think that that was necessary because yeah. her speech, it's a, it, I think it is a more today type speech, oh, sort yeah. of like how they would view Barbie and why Barbie sales had been slumping, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But we need that because when we get to America's speech, um, I actually think it's the highlight of the film. Mm. It's, it's very powerful. It's also very, here I'm going to spell it out for you, but unfortunately, it's something that kind of needs to be spelled out. Yeah, I agree. I, um, it's very easy for Max and I to sit here and come off our own theories and talk about women's sides of things and stuff. We're not women. We don't have the experience. You're we, not. <clears throat> yes, I You've know. You've been the, lying to me all this time. I I know that my long that girl hair has fooled you, you for years. Taffeta. <laughs> I never have worn taffeta in my life. I don't even know how to spell it. But yeah. I think that you do need to... Somebody needs to... And they need to be given their moment to say it. Mm. And the way she describes what it takes to be a woman in the modern American world, you just, I honestly don't think there's a room for anybody to do anything but sit there and get more and more slack-jawed. Yeah. It's like, I can't argue with any of that. It's like, I don't want that to be true, but yeah, it is. Or yeah. even the little thing when Sasha throws out and then the car, everyone hates women. Even women hate women. Yeah. It's the one thing everyone can agree on. Well, and that goes back to the part about everybody's appearance has to be perfect in mm. Barbie land or else, you know, oh, mm, you yeah, end up it. being weird, Barbie. Yeah. Yeah. I will say, too, and I, I think that this is something that is dealt with a bit in the film, only mm. at the very end. In the beginning... Barbie's not very nice to Ken. No, she's just, she treats him, there's a line oddly from another movie, a Pixar movie, Toy Story 3, where there's Ken and Barbie are in that. And somebody insults Ken at one point by saying, you're not even a toy, you're an accessory. <laughs> and he is. Yeah. It's absolutely true, but yet that's how she treats him. Well. He's like, well, you're there, you exist, or... When, when he wants to come over, and it's like, well, we're having a party. It's girls' night. You can go now. Yeah. But, ouch. Yeah. It's, it, this is going to come back to the metaphor, but I thought it was interesting that they didn't just... If this isn't a women are awesome and men suck movie. It's, it's not that. It is mostly, from a women's perspective, 
But that's not entirely there. There's moments where women are being terrible too. It's not presenting women as you know flawless because that presenting women as like flawless Madonna creatures. Yeah, uh, is just as bad. No, no, they're just mean, people um, like I mean uh, the holy, the holy not, Madonna. I don't mean Miss Chicone from New Jersey. Yeah, right. Except I think she's originally from Detroit. Believe it or not, oh, she really? grew up. In, yeah, I think she grew up in Jersey, but I think oh. she's originally from Detroit. Mm. I do love the idea put out there, right center stage, big spotlight on it, that rock and roll is indeed a mating ritual. <laughs> That's all it's for. Yeah. We, we're just trying to lure you rock. away from that rock and roller to this rock and roller yeah. to do unspeakable things. Hey, rock and roll, the term, was an old jazz term for sex. Yeah. I want to give a big shout out to all of the people who played Ken mm. and to Margot Robbie, because I do know this was a problem. That the, all the Kens did their dance off, yeah. and none of them broke up into laughter. Yeah, because <laughs> I don't know how they the whole did it. War of the Kens sequence on the beach is hilarious, and they all look—they're so into it. Yeah, of course they are. <laughs> they're so serious about it. Apparently, Margot Robbie did have a lot of trouble keeping a straight face with Ryan Gosling's performance. <laughs> he is—I he, gotta say—we talked about as this is a comedy. Yeah. He's funny as hell. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is, a, as we said, an amazing, amazingly complex message in a bright pink package. And then near the end, mm -hmm. we talked a little about this, we are hit in the chest with this Billie Eilish song. Mm. Now, they only give you a little bit to start, and then it plays over the credits. Listen to that song. It is one of the most heartbreaking, hard-hitting songs I have oh. heard in a long time. Mm -hmm. It's really good. I love Billie Eilish, mm -hmm. but, whoo, yeah, this is not a movie for kids. <laughs> Oh dear! And what? No, no, it's a good thing. Yeah, no, but, but it, it is. Pay, it is. It hurts. Yeah, in, in the, as they say, it hurts so good. Yeah, but what isn't this movie about? Self awareness, inequality, politics, maturity, existential, sexual system. identity, se yeah. you know, gender roles, everything. Yeah, it is trying to do a lot. Do you want to get to the metaphor? Yeah. Okay. For me. The metaphor between the real world and Barbie land doesn't hold too much scrutiny. Yeah. The rules are mushy at best. That's the um, thing. It appears to be perfectly easy for anyone to travel between the two. Right. They just don't, which also, means... Why is the FBI monitoring <laughs> the people coming from Barbie land? This is a per It's a big deal. Yeah. We don't know why. Well, and then it's like, oh, the dolls are influencing the real world because when Ken goes back and changes Barbie land, Barbie land into a Kendom, yeah. like, but like literally in seconds, the factories are already <laughs> making the Ken Dojo, Mojo Dojo Casa House, <laughs> and there's already a movie that's already made money before it's been yep, made. Yep. So if that's if and it goes back and forth, right? Because the idea is that oh, the real world, the people playing with Barbies influence so that's why we have existential crisis yeah Barbie that's why again. it starts off that's yeah. how it starts is somebody is playing with barbie in a different way so why isn't barbie land patriarchal yeah like, well because uh, boys don't play with the of course it's true women if women uh, absorb, feel that way. yeah also well, women absorb the values of the patriarchy they can't help it it's saturated well that's what that's the whole idea yeah. when ken shows up with patriarchy and a horse <laughs> um, he instantly can change the mind of all the girls mm. and so does that affect the girls who are playing with Barbie? Like, is suddenly every girl who plays with Barbie sad and, like, mm -hmm. dim-witted and, like, I don't... Well, that's suddenly why depression Barbie's being released. I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just... If the real, real world has that much influence over Barbies, such as with weird Barbie, mm -hmm. I don't understand the matriarchal nature. I, I see what they're trying to do, but... There's all sorts of things that you... Ha if you start asking questions, like, what happens to the Barbies that are thrown away? Are there only... A hundred Barbies, because mm. they've sold over a billion of those yeah, things. Yeah, I mean, they, they would need their own planet. What happens to the ones that aren't played with anymore? Do they stop moving? Is there an island of dead Barbies or something? Yeah. I don't know. Never mind the um, weird Barbies who are played with too hard. What about the Barbies who kids modify? There's Man. a whole market for that. What was the name? What happens if a Barbie could get some, is gotten a hold of by Sid? Oh, yes, for Toy Story. Hey. Yeah. Uh, this is Decapitation Barbie, and uh, this is Limitless yeah, this, Barbie. Oh, this is Barbie grafted to the body of a rubber duck. Yeah, yeah so the, the metaphor of Barbie land in the real world in this film... It's a little problematic. It doesn't bear a lot of scrutiny. Yeah, yeah. The question is, does that matter? I think we'll get to that in the wrap-up, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Sure. 
Uh, I know we probably are running over at this point. I don't bit. care. Yeah. I think that There's this is... There's a lot to talk about. Well, it's a rare film that's presenting itself as one thing and pretty much not about that thing at all. Mm -hmm. And also, I think it's an important film uh, one way or another. It's a film that's very much in people's minds. It made a ton of money, which is not always an indicator of a good film. No. Uh, I'm looking, looking at you, Michael Bay. Well, heck, I'm looking at, what was it, last week's film, uh, the, the Cheap the Detective. Detective. Yeah, that made a, fair, a lot of money for its time. Well, it was more than five times its budget. Yep. It's like, uh, that's a great success, but um, why? But, uh, yeah, I, th I think that it's worth going over a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. How are you on notes? Do you think we uh, can get to that point? Cause well, you don't want to talk about the very end, I assume. Uh, yeah, let's leave that up to our audience. I was curious case. about something. At the end, why is Alan so happy? Nothing's changed for him. I don't know. But he's just delighted. He says, I'm so happy. But why? He's happy for you, his friends. You poor schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> Doomed to wear those shorts forever. Seriously. <laughs> the shorts that say, I'm not getting any. Mm -mm. I, I don't know how Midge got pregnant because it wasn't me. No, no. <laughs> of course, we I, don't know how that happens because they have no genitalia. No, but no. I think the first doll to have that was Baby Joey. Oh. Do you remember that? I know, I from, don't. They actually had a baby doll from All in the Family. And, oh. And he was anatomically correct. Uh, I didn't didn't remember they had one. Yeah. Any, all in the Family dolls. Ba baby Joey. Yep. Yeah. Nope. Uh, Get to the end? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The finish. So, Max, yeah. now you've seen the film three times. Three times. Now, all right, let's face it. Women have had their say. They've had their little oh, yeah. film. They got to say all that yep, dumb yep. crap. They've been thinking about it. Yep. <laughs> I'm waiting for Big Jim, the movie. <laughs> Big, it's Big the, Jim is the most masculine, manly <laughs> toy out there. And his close friend, Big Jeff. <laughs> and yes. Yeah. Big you know, that's Joe. Right. There were no big there were no women in that toilet. Anyway, not at all. They all wore all vests men. and no shirts. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Big Jim, I believe, was sold wearing nothing but a pair of gym shorts. Yeah. Very short, tight very, very, shorts. Yeah, anyway, yes. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, Max, women have said they had their say. Yeah, yeah. Women, uh, blah blah blah. Run. <laughs> They've had their little movie. Get me a brewski beer. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Why isn't there a beer called brewski? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. What did, what did you think the first time you saw it? I w wasn't sure. The first time I saw it, I was I had no idea what to expect, and it was not what I expected. And I was like, wow, what it's saying is important. I'm not sure if it's a good movie. Okay. Uh, I also wasn't sure how funny it was. Mm -hmm. uh, then the second time I saw it, it's like, okay, this is pretty funny. Okay. Third time I saw it, like, okay, this is funny. It's really well directed. It moves along well. I think it's trying to do a little much. And sometimes it gets a little unfocused, I have to say. And you can argue that maybe we need to be hit over the head. But after a while, I got kind of tired of being hit over the head. Well, to be fair, you have seen it three times. Yes. Did you feel that way when you saw it the first or second times? First time, no. Second time, yes. Okay. So what did I think? Yeah. I saw it with um, one of our longtime poll question answers, Dr. Rebecca Pelkey. That's Professor Dr. Rebecca. It is. Pelkey. She was visiting, and she's like, "I kind of want to see this," mm -hmm. and I was like, "Yeah, what the heck?" I was not interested, but I want. I like going to the movies, and I like Becca, so I was like, "Let's go." Mm -hmm. And I had, no, I just thought, "Okay, it's Barbie. Why? Do, I have literally." Negative interest in Barbie. The only interest I ever had in Barbie was when I was a kid, and my 12 inch, not the little short ones they have now, yeah. 12 inch G.I. Joe hijacked Barbie's van, <laughs> rammed it into Barbie's dream house. Uh, yeah, yeah. And the first time, very much like you, the first time I saw the movie, people asked me, was it a good movie? And I'm like, I don't know. The, the message is so important, I don't think it matters. Huh. I didn't feel as hit over the head as you did. Not at all. In fact, when it was very obvious, I didn't care because, again, I thought it was important. Okay. The second time, very much like you, I could sit and watch it as a movie, mm. and it is funny. Yeah. It is a perfect film for this series. You know, what's so funny? A lot of things. Yeah. A lot of the funniest parts, I will have to say, do go to Ryan Gosling yeah. because he's such a doofus. Well, he is. He's, the cl he's partly, he's a more comic character. But we have some other really nuanced performance. Rhea Perlman oh, yeah. as Ruth Handler mm -hmm. is wonderful. It's yeah. she's such a it's such a small role. Uh, no pun intended. <laughs> it is such a small role, but 
Yeah. She, like the woman in uh, in the bus stop, mm. is so in control of herself. Yeah. There is no doubt. There is nothing. I did what I needed to do. I did what I did. What I did was right, and we are where we need to be. And she's not panicked when the bad guys show up. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, she's dead, so well, she's a ghost. I mean, Will Farrell says yeah, her ghost has an office on the seventeenth floor. Yeah, we, there's another metaphor we're not going to look yeah, too hard at. Yeah. It moves along very well. It's about two hours, mm -hmm. and it moves along. It's, yeah. it's fun to watch the whole time. It has just enough music, not too much, because we don't need it to be a musical, which mm -hmm. I'm glad it's not. I think the message is very important. I think it's well acted. I think it's well written. Is it best picture material? Here's the problem. I don't know that I've seen it. Oh, no, I saw Oppenheimer. Is it a better movie than Oppenheimer? Because you've seen both, haven't you? Yeah, I have. What would you say? I'm going to say Oppenheimer's probably the top contender at this point. I don't know. There's a bunch of the others, The Holdovers and uh, American Fiction. I haven't seen American Fiction yeah. or was it Life... Someone folding down. I can't remember. There's a bunch. Of, I've only I've seen slightly fewer than half of the Best Picture nominees. Yeah, I would put this up against Oppenheimer. I think it's a very different kind of movie. It's a lot shorter. Uh, but, <laughs> only, it's only two thirds the length of yeah, Oppenheimer. <laughs> yeah, or Killers of the Flower Moon. Also yeah. a remarkable movie. Very different types. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I am so happy to see a comedy nominated. Yeah. I they know, don't right? nominate comedies, and they almost never win. I think they've been like four. Yeah, Life is Beautiful, Ilsa She Wolf of the SS, Deep House, and uh, World Warfare 3. Yes, yes, that's, that, that's right. That's all four. Yeah. I, I think that it does have some structural issues. We mm -hmm. talked about the metaphor. The metaphor doesn't make sense. Yeah, it doesn't quite hold up. It's, there's, there's rules. It's like when Harry Potter can suddenly do that thing that no you, magic can't do that except this one time when it can. Yeah. There are weird things about the influence back and forth that don't really bear scrutiny. It's such a minor point, I don't really care. Yeah. When I mean, we've talked about this many times, when the film is like, when there are issues with the storytelling, or there's issues with the story or the logic, but the storytelling's so good you don't care, this is one of those yeah, points. It's not, yeah, the storytelling is so good, the performances are so good, the direction is so good. And the message is really important. Yeah. Um, why women don't have this much opportunity to do stuff in anywhere, especially Hollywood, I don't know. They're obviously fully qualified. Let them go. Oh, that's a, that, that's a multi-part show to answer that. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, Well, and we can't answer that. But too. yes. But, so we like it. Good yeah. movie. Go see it. Yeah. If you I, haven't, you probably have because a lot of people have. But I, yeah. It's, even with us talking as much as we have, I think it will surprise you. It's a mm. film that will surprise you. <laughs> But, yeah, so that's the end of, uh, of that. But we do yeah. want to talk about our poll question we again. Because we want to know, um, and I uh, don't know what brought this to mind, <laughs> but uh, what movie do you think should have won the Best Picture Oscar but didn't? Do let us know and let us know by emailing us directly at us at maxmikemovies.com. You can also go to our website, which has every episode all separated with little dividers, and they're all set around with fever trees, and uh, never mind. That's the Great Limpopo River. Sorry about that. But all the, the episodes are separated. You can leave comments. You can leave answers to the poll question. You can give us ideas for series or movies we should watch. That is, of course, at maxmikemovies.com. If you'd like, you can leave us a message on our social media, the one and only that we're on, which is Facebook, Max Mike Movies. And again, if you think we should be on Blueski or, uh, I don't know, Instagram or something else, Mastodon, let us know. Whatever. So far, nobody has. Uh, let us know. We can do that. And last but not least, if there is a podcast up out there, we're on it. Mm -hmm. So Max Mike Movies is the name of the show. But this this is over. We are done. Yeah. There's no more comedies. There was only nine mm -hmm. ever. Yep. <laughs> Nothing is funny ever again. No. But. Actually, next week it won't be. <laughs> no, no, it won't. What are we doing next week, Pinky? Well, one day I was looking at my YouTube feed and what pops up but a little video about Pat Oswalt. We don't need to know about, oh, oh, Pat Oswalt? Okay. <laughs> a little video about Pat Oswalt yeah. going into the closet. Oh, it, what? At the Criterion Collection. Ooh. To pick out his favorite films from the Criterion Collection. Oh. So Pat Oswalt. Uh, and we did get permission for this. We did. We we, con we contacted Mr. Oswald. I contacted Oswald. my close personal friend, Pat and Oswald, who we are now best friends, and we're going to live in a house on the moon and fight Nazis. <laughs> no, we, we talked to uh, one of his I think, publicists or management yeah. team or what have you and said, we'd like to do this. Is yeah. that okay? And once they understood that, A, we weren't actually asking for money, and <laughs> we weren't asking him to appear on the show, we no. just wanted to use this, they were like, yeah, go ahead. Although, heck, if Pat and is listening... Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and wants to be on the Sorry. show, we would love to have you. I, yeah, well, you know, send us an audition tape. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we've required that in the past. Oh, yeah. But we are going to do a little series mm-hmm. called Because Patton Said So. Mm-hmm. And it is based on his list of top films as seen on the Criterion Collection. And we are going to uh, showcase the first of those films next week in our series called Because Patton Says So. Mm-hmm. And it's a film I'd not heard of, and it actually would have fit in with a series we did a couple back mm-hmm. called Walk the Dark Street. This is a film back going back to 1945, a film I'd never heard mm-hmm. of, and if I remember correctly, doesn't star anyone I know. Huh. It's called Detour. 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 So... It's French for the tour. Sure, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, so if you would like to enjoy our, join our detour, you may come back oh, so next it's about, week. it's about a tour. Yes, so it is about a three-hour tour. A three-hour tour. Oh, three hour France, tour? An island off the uh, coast of France <laughs> where you may be stuck for three years. Who knows? Mm. But no, show up next week and join us and Patton, in a way. Yeah, kind of. For detour. Detour. <laughs> This has been a co-production of The Voice of Max and The Movie Wrench. Mm-hmm.